Thank you. Uh, welcome to the annual Catherine Silverstone Lecture 2023. My name is Dominic Johnson. I am the head of the Department of Drama here at Queen Mary. The annual Catherine Silverstone Lecture is an opportunity to sustain collectively Catherine's sensibility as a scholar, colleague, teacher, and friend. It celebrates Catherine's life and work and enables in her memory, a community of thinkers and makers that includes but extends beyond the Department of Drama at Queen Mary. Welcome everyone. Tonight, we are honored to have with us Catherine's partner, Julia, and Catherine's parents, Anne and Brian, who join us remotely from New Zealand. I hear it's 5.30 in the morning, so um, thank you. I'll say some words about Catherine and her achievements. I'll tell you a little bit more about the annual lecture, and then I'll introduce our distinguished speaker for this evening. Professor Catherine Silverstone was an esteemed scholar of contemporary queer and decolonial studies, including in Maori performances of Shakespeare, the films of Derek Jarman, club performance, queer adolescence narratives in film and theater, and performances of queer and feminist affirmation and remembrance, trauma and death. Her first monograph, Shakespeare Trauma and Contemporary Performance, was published in 2011. And in that book, Catherine accounts for the persistent, pernicious effects of violence and its theatrical representation through case studies of the mediation of violence perpetrated by individuals and by states in the context of apartheid, racism, colonization, homophobia, and war. An overarching pro problem Catherine approached in her work was the seductiveness of violence and the ease with which it can be represented by those who may seek to relieve its real effects, but who, by doing so, may demean, repeat, or amplify violence. Catherine co-edited with Sarah Annis Brown the an anthology Tragedy in Transition and in edited special issues of academic journals on Derek Jarman's passion for the early modern and on queer affirmation. In 2015, Catherine edited a scholarly edition of the folio and quarto texts of Titus Andronicus for the Norton Shakespeare, now the benchmark edition for students and scholars of Shakespeare's goriest play. Shakespeare was for Catherine rarely viable as an object of recuperation and more often a conspicuous alibi for continuing injustices, inequities, disparities of power and privilege, and misjudgments of meaning or effect. Catherine's first degrees were a Bachelor's and Master of Arts in English at the University of Waikato in Hamilton, Aotearoa, New Zealand, where she graduated in 1998. She received a Commonwealth scholarship to undertake doctoral research at the University of Sussex. After completing her DPhil, uh, on the topic of Spectres of Shakespeare in 2003, she was appointed to a lectureship at Anglia Ruskin University, and she joined the Department of Drama here at Queen Mary in 2007. During her time at Queen Mary, Catherine excelled in many roles, including as Director of Graduate Studies and Director of Teaching and Learning, and as a founding member of the Sexual Cultures Research Group. Those of us who had the pleasure to work with Catherine knew her to be a subtle and incisive scholar and a generous mentor. She was an incredibly generous and committed teacher and took very seriously the needs and ambitions of her students. And she was an incredibly attentive doctoral supervisor. And it's really wonderful to see many of her former supervisees here tonight. Catherine also became a judicious and meticulous leader, notably in her tenure as head of the School of English and Drama, including during the hardships of the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic. While in that role, Catherine became ill in July 2020, and she died on the 4th of October 2020. Catherine was a humble, nonchalantly brilliant scholar, she was fundamentally curious about the resistant political work that theater and performance especially might do. 
Catherine observed very keenly that the past reverberates in the present, hence perhaps what might seem a kind of extreme historical capaciousness in the horizon of what she found relevant or urgent to write about, which ran fluidly, promiscuously, from the early modern to the present. She was as capable writing about Titus Andronicus, or Tis, a, Tis Pity She's a Whore, as she was anatomizing theatrical trauma work in post-apartheid South Africa, or queer embodiments of Hamlet in the lip-sync performances of Dickie Bow, queer selling and buying in Ducky's gay shame parties, or Nando Macias's monuments to transphobic violence in the streets of the East End. Catherine had so much left to say and do. Her files of unfinished writings included sketches and passages for a book project on theater and death. For example, in her unpublished notes, she asks, quote, how might performances produced in the proximity of death be accounted for? How might the cultural death work of theater be accounted for? How does the performance of death operate in rela relation to the machinery of theatrical representation? What are the implications of thinking about performance as a kind of death for writing about performance, especially in relation to debates about presence? What are the ethical implications of performing, spectating, and writing about death? Perhaps the performance of death functions, often through acts of mourning, to demarcate the boundaries of the living and the human in culture more broadly. This in turn provides an index of the value and lack of value accorded to individual lives and communities and it identifies the possibilities that performance can offer to create and challenge conceptions of human value, end quote. How like Catherine to be so forensic in her questioning and so sensitive to the sufferings of others as a problem of representation of its ethics and its politics? How like Catherine to be so prescient in her own performance of inquiry, including in her address to us now belatedly. Her questions now left open tell us of Catherine's abiding concern for how meaning comes to be made about that which matters most. Her questions suggest that culture conspires to make some meanings possible or impossible. Some stories are available to be received while other stories become invalidated or disappear and require our care and our vigilance for their creative and committed reclamation and reconstitution. Her unfinished death work speaks to our unfinished grief work, our loss work, our continuing memory work. The Department of Drama and the community of theater and performance scholarship in which we are embedded remains incomplete by our losing of Catherine. But we remain grateful too for the memory of her friendship, for her continuing influence and her life. <clears throat> the annual Catherine Silverstone lecture invites a speaker to present research that is distinguished for its reflection of some of the characteristics of Catherine's own research. Rigorous, passionate, and intellectually searching in its attention to theater and performance, or elegant in its interdisciplinarity. Committed to challenging the authority of the canon, whether by disturbing the influence of historical texts and authorships, or by trafficking seemingly illegitimate objects and practices into scholarship and robustly inclusive in its concern for feminist, queer, trans, indigenous, black and brown scholarship and practices. And this year's lecture is presented by Claire Hemmings, Professor of Feminist Theory in the Department of Gender Studies at the London School of Economics. 
Her books include Considering Emma Goldman, Feminist Politics of Ambivalence and the Historical Imagination of 2018, and Bisexual Spaces, A Geography of Sexuality and Gender of 2002. Her second prize-winning book, Why Stories Matter, The Political Grammar of Feminist uh, if, um, Theory of 2011, explored how feminists tell stories about the history of feminism as stories of progress, loss, return, or recovery, of recitation, disruption, or empathy, and asked why these stories matter and what we can do to transform them. Her edited collections include The Handbook of Feminist Theory of 2014, Traveling Concepts in Feminist Pedagogy of 2006, Practicing Interdisciplinarity in Gender Studies 2006, Haunting Feminism, Encounters with Lesbian Ghosts for Feminist Theory 2019, and Special Issues of Feminist Review on Revolutions in 2014, Transforming Academies in 2010, Sexual Moralities in 2006, and Everyday Struggling in also of 2006. Recent articles and book chapters have explored varied themes and problems for queer and feminist theory, including the affective resonances of ignorance and ambivalence, sexual freedom and the promise of liberation, feminist reparation, feminist pedagogies, and colonial legacies in the legislation of sexuality. Who better then than Claire Hemmings to present this year's annual, Cath annual Catherine Silverstone lecture? A little housekeeping note, um, the lecture will last around 55 minutes and we'll close without questions as is customary for this annual lecture. At the end though, I invite you to join us for refreshments in the foyer of the Arts One building. Um, so at the end, it's a short walk um, and my colleagues and, and a student ambassador will be hovering somewhere here at the end to uh, lead uh, the way if you don't know uh, the directions. Um, you can also, once, once we're there, you can visit the memorial bench for, for Catherine, which our students funded and installed in her memory. Um, so come find me or a colleague and we'll show you where that is. So tonight's lecture is titled Accepting the Gifts, Reading Loss as Queer Feminist Method. Please join me in welcoming Professor Claire Hemmings. Thanks so much, uh, Dominic, for such a warm welcome. Um, and thank you um, to uh, Catherine's friends, family and colleagues for making me feel so welcome uh, and for hosting um, the Catherine Silverstone annual lecture uh, and to Queen Mary Department of English and Drama, uh, of course, for, for uh, that honor. Thank you to you all as well for um, coming along this evening um, to honour Catherine Silverstone. I've titled, um, I've, I've slightly changed the title as often happens, uh, and it's now, uh, it's, it's, um, it's on the same theme. <laughs> don't, don't panic. <laughs> um, it's accepting the gifts, reading with grief as queer feminist practice. So here with you today, I want to reflect on what it means to read through and with grief as part of honouring friendship, knowledge and politics from a queer feminist perspective. I'll be reading through and with my friend, Amal Treacher Kabesh, who died in 2022 and who left a substantial body of work that engages central and impossible questions of our times. Feminist religious and secular uncertainty, masculinity and cultural translation, the inner lives of children, and most profoundly, the question of what it means to approach others, confront and respect others, and engage across difference. Amal was an Anglo-Egyptian scholar who lived between Cairo, Nottingham, and London, and who worked from within psychosocial studies to provide intellectual input into social work practice and political activism. I also want to give attention to accepting the gifts, as Derrida put it, that Catherine Silverstone has left us, 
I didn't know her personally, but in reading her work, some themes that I've been grappling with myself, the nature of queer loss, sexual and gendered violence and representation, the present tense of coloniality have been amplified and clarified. In remembering Derek Jarman, Silverstone asks, what do memories of a life or death bring into the public domain? What do these acts of remembering enable and occlude? What do they suggest about relationships between the living and the dead? Time stops for the dead, but the surviving person is also arrested or stopped, Judith Butler reflects, experiencing themselves as impoverished, just as the loss of the loved one impoverishes the world. And Jack Derrida insists in the work of mourning that nothing can begin to dissipate the terrifying and chilling light of this certainty, that the one of whom we speak, who we cite, whom we try to let speak, is no more, is no longer here, is no longer there. <clears throat> but we cannot seek to ameliorate this pain by remembering the dead through showing off some secret contract that allows us to imagine that our friend still lives within us intact, Derrida says, of Roland Barthes. For that is pure bad taste, as we finish off our friend by exalting them. And yet for Butler, for Derrida, for Silverstone, we must find a way to do our duty to dead friends, representing their singularity through attention to the unique detail of their traces in the world. This lecture is thus a way of trying to address and engage the singularity of Amal as a complex knower who developed tools that might help me keep doing queer feminist work in the face of disappointment and pain. And in drawing Catherine Silverstone's singularity into the conversation, I hope to shed light on the importance of dwelling in bad feeling, refusing to sit in historical certainties and opening up of queer feminist translations. I address them both in the letters that follow through grieving as allowing for desire, to think through grieving as allowing for desire as well as loss. For after all is said and done, grief is surely queer from the start. Dear Amal, I remember meeting you for the first time when I joined the Feminist Review Collective Away Days in the summer of 2004. I was anxious, and as you know, when I'm anxious, I take myself very seriously indeed. You called me daft when I made what I thought was a particularly good suggestion. <laughs> Claire, don't be so bloody daft, you said, and that shocked me out of my uncertain arrogance. I hustled to sit next to you at breakfast, lunch and dinner the next two days. <clears throat> I, learned how quickly, I learned quickly how much I loved being close to you, leaning into you, basking in your smile and full bodied laughter. You smelled like jasmine and warm wood. I began to learn about the importance of slowness from you that weekend. You stopped us moving on too fast, kept us in the complexity of difficult questions of difference and listened carefully to what people were trying to say underneath the noise of their bluster. We were 15 unruly, impatient feminist collective members and you kept us grounded. You apologized over the last breakfast for resisting my joining the collective. Oh God, you told me you'd said, all we need is another young white queer scholar taking their eye off the anti-racist ball. Waving away my acknowledgement that you might have been right to be suspicious by ordering a full English breakfast that we shared. <laughs> By the end of the weekend, I'd signed up to co-edit a special issue of Feminist Review with you, Everyday Struggling, and became the editor for your article, Children's Imaginings and Narratives, that remains my favorite piece of your writing. We worked together at the journal for eight years, co-wrote an article on the horrors of neoliberal agency and affect, read and talked about each other's work over two decades. 
You visited me in Paris and Marseille, where our friend Helen and I celebrated your 60th birthday with you. We were friends. You believed in the hard work, Amal. You believed that work is the only thing to do when faced with the obstacles littered on the path to a good life. The brutality of inevitable misrecognition, the endurance of lack of respect, displacements and longing. You were committed to that work, inevitably failing to achieve even of the most modest of its aims. And you frequently reminded me in person as well as in print that doing feminist anti-racist work in particular is all the more important for that. You were deeply committed to the idea of the worthwhile struggle and a lively living body, never still, always engaged with itself and the world. This capacity to accept that writing, no, life itself, is always about that struggle, meant that you were intellectually and instinctively drawn to ethical consideration of others as the rooted heart of any feminist post-colonial project. In your last piece of writing on Palestine from 2021, you insist that despite the pains and struggles of being a human being and the unspeakable difficulties, we are always urged into life by living. And that's one of your eloquent gifts, Amar, that with all the tangled horror of histories of violence, so tangled and so horrible that you are often almost speechless with longing and loss, only real engagement with others, real listening to others will help us endure another grim day with its banal as well as demanding ghosts. To imagine differently, we have to refuse to succumb to despair, cultivate what you call, via Edward Said, a scrupulous subjectivity. Only then will we have a chance to simply, deceptively simply, see things as they are. You used to like to say that we narrate the world in order to make it palatable. And in children's imaginings, you explain that narratives are the stories we tell to ourselves and others. They are the attempt, partial and inadequate, to make sense of that which is otherwise incomprehensible and overwhelming. Crucially, too, storytelling is what enables humans, young and old, to hold out the possibility of changing the conditions they attempt to describe. You gave such profound attention to the children you worked with, playing with them, giving them space, letting them be, only then asking them to tell you stories from the fragments you had helped them pull together about their lives. And I'm struck by the most profound lack of judgment at the core of this work. You always ask what it is those children are trying to tell you about themselves and the world. You loved all of those children and not just some of them. That's why you were able to hear their complex stories and that's why they trusted you to receive them. You tell the wonderful story of Kareem, a boy aged eight who, quote, told, the, told of the journey his grandfather would have taken to arrive in Britain. He told it as if he had taken the journey himself using the present tense with all the energy of first-hand experience. He had so internalized and lived this story that he had no sense that he could not have been there. Even when the other children pointed this out with some derision, he held firm. He had been there. This was probably a family story that had been told, retold, remembered and recollected over and over again. For this boy, his grandfather's story had actually become his own. The boy's narrative arises from his family's history of migration, and he embodied his family history so profoundly that I physically ached as I listened to him, you say. Oh, Amal, I know you did ache as you listened to Kareem. He opened up to you, an adult he hardly knew, because he knew you would rather have poked your own eyes out than have crushed his conviction. And I know you will have recalled your own family history of migration, of loss and reparation, of desire and fantasy from within that ache. 
We don't work in institutions where the time and care that allows Kareem to trust you is valued, of course, but you refuse its bankrupt re relentlessness because you understand that your duty lies elsewhere. When I first met you, you interrupted my seriousness by teasing me and folded me into your life. You left, you leave your name, Amar, on the tag attached to a gift I can hardly bear to unwrap. You offered me the same care and attention you offered everyone in your life, and that formed the core of your method and thought. You taught me the importance of slowing down and witnessing the other, though I will always be a failing student. I find it easier to sit with feeling breathlessly aggrieved. I will try and sit in the time the work takes, though, if only to be reminded of your glow, your bodily presence I ache from missing. It's that silver hair that you never should have dyed. It's the enormous smile that everyone remembers that lit up the whole of your face. It's the scent of jasmine and warm wood. Dear Catherine, if I may, I have never met you, but I've been asked to give an annual lecture in your honor. And if I'm honest, the thought of it is overwhelming. I want to apologize from the start that there's no way I'll be able to do you or the people who loved you justice. But I'll take the only liberty available to me for this task, speaking into that gap between me and the you I've met in your writing. I started reading your work on Jarman first, enjoying the fact that a queer feminist performance theorist, mostly focused on the early modern, also wrote on this queer icon. And because I wanted to know what you thought of grief before I tried to work out what I think about grief, <clears throat> I've been reading Denise Riley's essay on the death of her son, Time Lived Without Its Flow, an exquisite heartbreaking reflection that grapples with temporality and its halting, giving us the image of profound grief as the thud of a ball that won't bounce, has no forward life. Thud, thud, and again, thud. And that's also part of how you grapple, Catherine, asking what it even means to try and represent feelings of loss from within the collapse of the public and private that comes when someone dies, what it means to keep them close without a violent co-optation of their singular precious past. And I'm reading you too to find out how we might think queerly about death and those of us left behind. You are no fan of the false positivity of moving on, I soon realize and are deeply critical of the assimilation of gayness into a fast-paced neoliberal economy that certainly has no time to sit with loss. You understand feeling bad as key part of queer life, a starting point for critique of heterosexual imperatives that would deny us all a queer future. You love your Jose Munoz and Anne Svetkovic. <laughs> as we all do, and so you take that risk of flinging yourself into a felt te queer temporality that allows for the flashes of pleasure and recognition that sustain us. For both Munoz and Svetkovic, sustainable queer lives cannot afford to forget threat, need to live in anticipation of its materialization precisely in order to stitch those flashes together into a reworked bumpy queer history. And you take that task very seriously, Catherine, working hard in your cherishing of queer adolescent possibility, for example, to keep that grieving place of queer loss and trauma open. But because you are a queer feminist performance theorist, you also turn away from the hyperbole of Lee Edelman's No Future and its didactic refusal of reproductive heterosexual imperatives and back around to Teresa de Laretis, our archdeaconess of queer subcultures. 
I've always loved De Laurentiis' invitation to join her in a gendered, racialized scene of desire in all its messy glory and to think about how to replay it queerly, playing all the parts, expanding a future without underestimating the relentlessness of heteronormative gendered plot. It's De Laurentiis whose understanding of gender as mise-en-scene allows you to challenge the blunt authority of sexed authenticity in your piece on cross-gendered casting in Richard II. That commitment to staging allows you to dwell in the representation of gender, the image of sex, and in that exchange of narrative inexorability for spatial possibility, you begin to articulate a queer feminist politics of action based in proximity and attachment, in slow motion and fast forward, in subtext, in repetition. In the end, you didn't have a choice. <clears throat> you had to relinquish those impatient boys, Daddy Derrida, ecstatic Edelman, even melancholic Munoz, <laughs> who won't ultimately sit with the repetition in the way that the feminist in Queer Feminist always has to. P.S. I'm hoping you don't mind my rather caustic tone in the last part of this letter. But in fact, I've borrowed it from you. <laughs> I was starting to risk falling into romanticizing your herbs, insistent generosity, and then I read your book reviews <laughs> and was reassured. I just loved the, this is a nice book, but here's its fatal flaw, just saying. <laughs> Grammar that you perfected. <laughs> You recognize this. <laughs> Dear Amal, this isn't going to be easy. I keep coming back to the last time I saw you. You, Helen, and I met, as we so often did, for dinner, and you insisted, as you often did, on coming our way. I'd not seen you for almost two years because of COVID, but I knew what a difficult time you'd had and that you'd fallen on uneven pavement outside a supermarket and hurt yourself badly. Your diabetes had got worse and you were living on your own. I'd had the impulse when you told me about falling to get in the car and drive up and get you from Nottingham. And you said not to. You said not to, and of course you did. And I didn't. I was relieved to. I both wanted you to say yes, and I didn't want you to. And so I managed my guilt by berating you on the phone instead, telling you to get the proper help from neighbours, the proper food, the proper medical advice. I'm angry with you for not taking better care of yourself, which is to say I'm angry with myself for not being able to take care of you, which is to say I never wanted to take care of you in the first place. And I'm filled with rage that you ever expected it. <laughs> you can stop laughing now, Mar. My shame binds me to the past and my dream of rescue has turned to dust. But here you were now, struggling towards us, leaning on a stick, physically clearly in pain, and a mile I could only barely recognise. So I berated you again for getting the bus, for Christ's sake, and carrying, as you always did, a ludicrously large backpack jammed with student essays. I berated you for one thing and another so that I could remake you into Amal and me into Claire before we sat down. We ate, we laughed, but the evening was filled with shadows. We didn't quite know what to say to each other because time was short and what needed saying would have taken longer than the three of us had. Would that time had stopped still and three hours could have become three days? We could have just sat there under the scaffolding at Root Restaurant in Dalston. Me and Helen putting the world to rights, you asking difficult questions, circling back, ordering a few more dishes, drinking nasty rosé, suddenly leaning into one another and then back out to ask about a mutual friend. When you left, you pulled yourself back onto a number 38 bus, still refusing to get a cab, smiling and waving at us but wincing as you sat down. 
I was always telling you off. The universities you worked at drew you in and spat you out. They loved your inability to say no and your commitment to young people's flourishing. So they piled on the admin roles and belittled your attention to detail. But as you know, I was also deeply irritated by your seeming acceptance of any institutional demand. You never seemed to take my excellent advice about how to say no and ignored me when I gave you precise instructions about how to get the best deal for retirement. And that rage was only amplified after you died, not even six months after leaving the, and the, University of Nottingham, um, the University of Nottingham, where you worked for 16 years, awarded you, not with the full professorship you so richly deserved, no, but with the Vice Chancellor's Medal in recognition of your outstanding contribution to advancing equality and diversity and inclusion at the university. Give me a break. When we wrote our piece together on the neoliberal horrors of agency and affect in the contemporary neoliberal workplace, my lack of reflexivity about the impact of the institution escaped me. So I enthusiastically embraced our astute critique of the increasing need in academia, as well as elsewhere, to cast, quote, vulnerability in capacity to act in one's own interests. <clears throat> or exhaustion as personal failings, while assertiveness and capacity bring success. We rightly pointed to effective management in our own positions of relative economic and employment privilege, where we, felt, where we feel helpless, overwhelmed or dependent, and we're further shamed as we have it relatively good and thus have no reason not to be more effectively aligned with the needs of the institution. We talk, too, of the differences between our own academic locations, your own complex responses to racism, meaning that you carried specific feelings of insecurity with you, making your exploitation, your enthusiastic taking on of burdensome administrative roles hard to challenge. And of my white middle class privilege that provided a buffer against queer feminist anxiety, framing the ways in which I found saying no easier than you did, and why we all tend to ask, why do you fail to say no over how did you get here? I loved that piece because not only did it mark a most prescient intervention into the degraded trajectory of higher education in the UK, it also allowed me to entertain my fantasies of you as the one who couldn't cope and me as the one who could. And even better, that this was because of our different locations and recognition, and that I was here to help you with the toughening up, lest you be even further oppressed by the demands of an uncaring department. But I see now in rereading this piece that I have other better reasons to love it, reasons that might be a little less overdetermined, a little less deluded. You were already telling me something, Amar, Though you didn't, even though you knew I wasn't listening. I was too busy being a productive but transgressive academic subject to face the fact that my own effective investments in overcoming despite were and remain almost impossible to shift. Yet you were careful to insert an important note in our joint text that agency is a sustaining fantasy of psychic and material life for privileged subjects as well. You were trying very gently to warn me that there would be a time, and probably quite soon, when I would come face to face with the naked aggression of an extractivist institution I had been pleased to imagine I would always have the skills to get the better of. You were trying to say, it looks as though your privilege protects you, Claire, and so it does. But it won't always, not necessarily, and not only in relationship to your overinvestment in queer marginality and its broken authority. And you had better be prepared, my friend, because if you continue with that sustaining fantasy, you will have precious few resources to weather that storm, no matter the pathetic rewards you have cherished, no matter how strong your fantasy that your agency had been in the service of a project that remained separate from the institution that underwrote it. 
The institution's true and brutal disinterest will cut your legs from under you as it did mine and convince itself and others that you are to blame for your rather unremarkable fall from grace. Thankfully, though, you never leave yourself a victim in this abject scene I am retelling. Because as you insist straight after your now less gentle prompt, quote, your own situation is also hardly one unmarked by the privileges of an academic life. Right in that moment, right there, you refuse to leave me stranded on the side of myopic privilege, joining me there instead to help me gather myself together when the time came, as you knew it would. You did that for me, Amal, from the bottom of your heart, from the strength of vulnerability, overwork and confusion that I dismissed then as a sign of your oppression, not of your knowledge, resilience and skill. And as things seem to get worse and worse, and then a bit worse again, and it's you I want to talk to about their seemingly endless worsening, I can open that gift still with some embarrassment, and bring into the present that capacity you had for absolute solidarity from a place stripped of fantasy, from that place of strong vulnerability and confusion, when, especially when, it really wasn't and still isn't deserved. Dear Catherine, I've been reading more of your work this weekend, and I'm increasingly sad that I never got to meet you. I'm drawn into the detail of your deeply loving relationship to theater through your commitment to the staging of performance, the bringing into the present of past representation and all the ethical and political as well as intellectual labor that requires. That repetition that already struck me when I read you first, that opening up of the scene of gender, sexuality, and race. It's definitely a kind of grieving, isn't it? To ask after the staging of drama over time, to look intensely at the ways it alters with different images, different contexts, different translations. Because you're keeping open the original and all its afterlifes. It's your way of showing how our desire for something new, for something remarkable, keeps traces of past possibilities alive. But what I really want to say is that I'm blown away, Catherine, by your careful, ethical, painful project on the staging of sexual violence. Theatre is, as you say, overpopulated with women's dead bodies. In your review of Othello that cast Lenny Henry, the black British actor and comedian, in the title role for the 2009 Northern Broadsides production, you point to the absurd and racist hubris of the theatre community's outcry at failing to colourblind cast on this occasion. You call that outcry out as blackface and as part of the history of disingenuous debate about black Othello. And you reflect on the difficulties of staging a text that pivots on sexual violence against a white woman by a black man, finding both to already be framed by the violence of their opposed positions in this most repeated of plays. The question of how to stage trauma is an abiding feature of your work. And you never shy away from the question of how representation and reproduction of trauma on stage can both critique and reinforce the operation of violence. Your focus is wide ranging on the homophobic violence that Gay Sweatshop Project showcases and refuses, on the Maori merchant of Venice that forms part of, quote, community resistance to the experience of settler colonial trauma. But what I really want to say is that I cried when I read your account of witnessing Desdemona's death in that production. I wasn't expecting to. You tell us a vivid story of going to the Trafalgar theatre run of the original, of sitting in the cheap seats and navigating the limits of your place. You realise shortly after the start of the play that you'll have to bear witness to the visceral death of Desdemona from that angle that nothing will be hidden of the staging of Othello's violence, 
against his wife. You talk of the impossibility of looking on the one hand or looking away on the other and explore the discomfort you experience that pushes you, um, quote, to reconsider the epics of both staging and watching repeatedly the violation of a woman. You describe the importance of the production decision that helped you stay in the scene of shrouding both Desdemona and her maid Amelia together at the end of the play, as Amelia asks in the text, but as is commonly ignored. But you also insist on witness as an ethical responsibility and hold firm to the conviction that there is both no way of doing this well and no way of avoiding doing it anyway. I also went to see that production of Othello, also at the Trafalgar Theatre, but sat in the stalls and didn't have to witness what you had to witness. I wish you'd pursued your interest in gauging audience responses, as you said you might, and that you'd been at the exit handing out surveys. I might have paused to ask what the research was about, and maybe we could have had a brief exchange. I wish I'd known you even a bit so that you could have told me what night you were going, Catherine. I would have said we should sit together in those cheap seats. And just before we poured our wine into plastic cups, you would have asked nervously, remind me again why we're going to see a play where mostly white spectators are asked to watch a black man murder a white woman and be witness to a series of vicious racist insults. I wish that we had sat together so that we could have both been shocked and then annoyed at being shocked at the inappropriate laughter that so often reveals the easy humour of racism and violence against women in any audience. And as the tension rose towards the final scenes, I would have grabbed your hand in terror at what it would mean not to look away when the deed was redone. But I wouldn't have looked away because you were right there, Catherine, clasping my hand. I'm holding your hand and see what it means not to look away, to witness that staging, that repetition of racism and the killing of women together. I see it. See both things together because you have already been there and borne witness. Here am I. Who's being bloody daft now? I laugh as I read your claim that you really don't know much about gender. <laughs> this from the woman who has written a book on masculinities in Cairo and London and another on gender and the revolutionary Middle East. In fact, gender is everywhere in your work, everywhere in your writing on childhood, on Egypt, on religion, on ethics, on the other, on Palestine. Perhaps what you mean is that you don't know much about the what and why of gender, its seeming inexorable tethering to sex, sexuality and race. I think what you mean is that gender bewilders you. In your signature way, Amal, you take that uncertainty and wield it as generous critique. Responding to your friend Farhad Dalal's work, you carefully talk him through the ways his reliance on fixed gender differences gives Muslim women no room to move or breathe. Writing with co-conspirator Hala Shukrala, you chide Western feminists for engaging with the Arab woman only when the issues are different to their own, remarking that this is precisely how fantasies of cultural difference are maintained. And in children's imaginings, you track how the children take up space and spin tales in complex gendered ways. Gender is not an object for you, nor even really an achievement, and it can never be straightforwardly tethered to the body. How could it be? It is a site of anxiety and difficulty that the children you care about try to narrate as best they can. Boys trying to keep within their drawing lines, Girls going over the edges, telling tales that were wild and full of danger and threat. You tell us they told stories of benign dolphins transforming into malevolent sharks, pulling bodies apart. These gruesome stories the girls tell point to an understanding of gender as a site of both struggle and loss. 
For Judith Butler, being a girl or a boy comes about through the homosexual prohibition. You become a girl to the extent that you cannot want a girl. Despite the fact that, of course, you have already wanted her. So part of that prohibition rests on forgetting that you ever did desire what you have had to become. You never did love, and so you never did lose that <clears throat> forbidden object of desire, Butler tells us. And to make matters worse, that never, never is founded on a disavowal that necessarily keeps on rearing its ugly head, because if we really never lo loved and lost, we wouldn't have had to take up that unlivable gendered position in the first place. So instead, in her own unique way of honoring the queer dead that this structure renders ungrievable, Butler asks us to accept that gender itself is composed of precisely what remains inarticulate in sexuality. Gender itself might be understood in part as the acting out of unresolved grief. Quick note, if you're still following me, Amar, in this quite remarkable restaging, it is the heterosexual woman who is the purest lesbian melancholic. And it is the drag queen's job to allegorize this for her. <laughs> I do accept Butler's proposition, and I think you did too, Amar. You can see that your eight-year-old girls are resisting the loss that heterosexual gendering requires, bringing grief and anger right into the frame before it's too late. They know what's being asked of them, of course, but when telling you a story, inhabiting the fiction that you give them license to, they transform into subjects who refuse the kinship relations that are already the source of so much disappointment with a fierceness you admire. Parents disappear in smoke, siblings turn out to be frogs, and the girls are always the heroines of their own extraordinary tales. They're fighting for their lives, Amal, holding on to what they have never lost and never had with that fierceness you admire. Their tales are wild and exciting and express something else altogether, inhabiting situations that can never be. These dolphins are transformed into sharks, after all. But it's not only the girls who are excessive, is it? Karim is too, that eight-year-old boy you told us about, who identifies with his grandfather so intensely that he becomes him. For boys to be boys, they are, of course, expected to identify with their fathers, but only so far and only so much. They are certainly not expected to skip a generation to become the grandfather hero of a familial story of migration. The children around Kareem scoff at his telling that story as his, as his own, remember. But Kareem is resolute. Perhaps this is how he honors the past, tells his own as well as his grandfather's story and in the process complicates both the colonial and the gendered plots that threaten to make a mere boy of him. Dear Amal, we're not going to get anywhere with gender as melancholia, let alone refused identification, until we address that cross-cutting post-colonial grieving Kareem embraces, are we? And to do that, we're going to have to talk frankly about your father. In her obituary for you, that was so, so hard for her to write, Susanna Radstone tells this story of your early life. Amal was born in London, where her father, Ahmed Kabesh, an Egyptian national, had studied for a PhD. Her mother was the daughter of the caretaker at the Egyptian embassy. Amal's early years were lived in comfortable surroundings in Cairo, where her father became a minister in NASA's government. There were ballet classes, an excellent school, and visits to Gropi's Cafe. But in 1964, after her parents' divorce, she moved back to London with her mother and sister Amani. Settling in Thornton Heath, where her mother worked for the gas board, life was very different. It is your beloved Susanna that mistress of understatement, who goes with you 20 years later to find your father. Armed only with an old address for a friend, we hailed a taxi and tracked Ahmed down, she remembers. 
Still later, you meet Amir in Cairo, fall in love with and marry him. And you begin to live as you did until you died between Cairo, Nottingham and London, trying to find a way of integrating your loves and losses in those spaces of translation. Towards the beginning of your book, Postcolonial Masculinities, you tell us disarmingly, my loving and close relationships are to Egyptian men. They get under my skin, cut through my being, penetrate me in a way that European men do not. And my relationships with them are full of stuff, fantasy and emotion. In the book, you show such bittersweet care for the Egyptian men in your life, whose melancholy you understand as their way of living the loss of failed national independence and failed revolutions over and over again. In your reading of the post-colonial novels that are the focus of this labor of love, you describe how, how both fathers sit, how fathers sit wasted and whiling away time as they stare into space, waiting for the perfect day. They wait in a state of what I can only describe as wanting. You find the ir irresolvable suffering of the men you dedicate yourself to unbearable. That might be why you relocate your analysis from the men who cut through your being to the diasporic stories and Egypt-based fiction you engage. Your book is about too much and too little, you tell us. It is too jagged and yet somehow overly smoothed and does not quite capture <clears throat> the sheddedness of lived experience. You remain perplexed and complain that you are living in a fog. You are at a loss as you try to shoulder their loss, as you try to hold together Ahmed's shame at what he saw as decades of pointless political participation, with Amir's shame and rage at economic dependence and familial breakdown. For you, as for Franz Fanon and Edward Said, it is the vacillation between pride and shame that binds the, the post-colonial men you love to an ideal and to the nation. But Amal, it is you too that is left shattered, tearful and guilty. And perhaps it's from within my own irritable gender melancholia that the impulse to shout at you bubbles up. I want to pull you out of that stifling fog of heterosexual devotion that I see, of course I must, as your downfall. I want to drag you away from that scene of repeated misery that your attempt to restage in the fictional stories you analyze to make your sadness at their sadness bearable never quite manages. I want you to refuse the position of lesbian melancholic as it inheres in your gendered devotion to come back to London where you belong. I hope you're enjoying my colonial gesture of incorporation of all. <laughs> my pitting of queer aggression against post-colonial melancholia. Oh, Claire. Gradually though, I start to listen to you again, staying on the page with you, trying to hear what you're trying to convey from within your professed speechlessness. You know, before anyone else knows, that you need to stay where you are. I am preoccupied, you tell us, over and over again in post-colonial masculinities. I am preoccupied, you tell us, with the interrelationship between events, narratives and discourses. I am preoccupied with the role of emotions and fantasy in public life. I am preoccupied with the following question and don't know what to think. I am deeply preoccupied with the meaning of post-colonial loss. And perhaps in that repetition and recognition of the haunting that is one meaning of preoccupation, along with obsession and fixation, you are trying to hold open a space of loss and understanding, refusing once again to move on too soon. Perhaps you're using your bewilderment as a way of forging solidarity with theirs in that extraordinary way that only you seem to know how to do. Perhaps in the end, you aren't trying to take on the melancholia of the men you love, but pulling open the door to a familiar haunt so that you might greet them there to grieve. <clears throat> At the end of the of post-colonial masculinity, you say, 
quote, I've started to realize that I am the one who haunts my father. I lock him firmly to the past and I have an ethical responsibility to release him. Dear Catherine, I want to come back again to your abiding concern with the staging of plays, the reinvention of them through casting, directing, and the sheer physicality of performance. That delightful refusal of the original as the basis of performance that's one of your scholarly signatures. I love your obsession, Catherine, as you track the history of Titus Andronicus. The different text in the folios, as well as the embrace and refusal of the original in all the performances of it you are preoccupied with. You must have been quite the nerd child, Catherine. <laughs> I can see you poring over the detail and challenging teachers unlikely to have had anything close to your levels of concentration. <laughs> or was your obsession part of being a young sports dyke? running your ranginess into strength on cross-country runs that helped you breathe yourself into being over and over again. In my last letter, I talked about your insistence on witnessing representations of sexual violence in performance, the impossibility of the necessary encounter with the staging of, of trauma. And in similar vein, I've been reading your analysis of Don Selwyn's 2001 film, The Maori Merchant of Venice, the first Maori adaptation of Shakespeare, and one that foregrounds the effects of colonization, especially in relation to te reo Maori language and culture. But of course, as you show us, the film does more than give that merchant a new stage that addresses indigenous violence. It translates into a deeply ethical conversation about how to address trauma across different and overlapping historical and contemporary experiences of it, between and across anti-Semitic and anti-Maori institutions and practices. That question of translation is key for your political practice of pedagogy too, as you say yes to the invitation to Brazil, to teach Maori Merchant of Venice, and where you seek to open up, quote, possibilities for discussing Shakespeare in relation to Brazilian histories of colonization, indigeneity, language, and cultural dispossession. You talk beautifully in that piece, it was published posthumously, of what you learned from the dislocating effects of place for thinking about geopolitics. You reflect on the time it takes you to realize that there above upper class Leblon in the hills that house the Rio Favela Vidijal, neither the Holocaust nor Antipodean genocides hold direct meaning for the young people you are working with. And it's that realization, that not knowing, that enables you to listen carefully to and think with what histories of genocide slavery and racism might mean for these particular young Brazilian people. I just got back from a workshop in Rio as well. I'm not stalking you. Where my partner and a friend and I hiked from the top of Vidigal, getting a bird's eye view of the city that includes its fault lines. So I can imagine you breathing the air and looking in wonder at that shimmering city too. I feel as though I'm shadowing you, acting as your understudy, so that I can learn how to take up these spaces you're reshaping for me, being brave in the audience first, then refusing tourist pedagogies. And as I look at the images of you working, I want to learn from you about the detail of staging political intervention in ways that keep open the pleasure as well as the pain. I don't know if you'd read Ranjan Akana's work, Catherine, but in her exceptional Dark Continents, she reflects on what she terms colonial melancholy. For Kana, colonial melancholia is always a critique. It's a critique of assimilation, first and foremost, of insistent gendered nationalism that seeks to obliterate the memory and the nature of difference formed in violence. The never, never for Kana is the space of impossibility as it is for Butler. But the post-colonial gendered subject's refusal to let it lie, to properly mourn and let go the anti-assimilation <clears throat> that she insists on 
is a political necessity, not a failure. Reading your analysis of repetition and politics has helped me see Canna's difficult psychoanalytic moves more visually, and they have finally started to take up space. There's something about embodiment in your work, Catherine, that Amal also keeps coming back to you, back to. For you, staging isn't only about casting or theme, it's about the proximity and distance of bodies from one another. You insist that a history can be told differently when someone exits more slowly or quickly, touches someone more closely or absentmindedly, moves or stays, occupies the stage. There's something here that Canna doesn't talk about, and that's the querying of histories of both gender and race through touch. The coming together that Sophie Hamas and Sabir Alouche place at the heart of queer Arab subversions of nationalism. In your attention to those bodies on stage, something like desire emerges too, not for the original, certainly not for the corrupt colonial heteronormative demand for devotion to its law but a desire to participate, to participate in the drama of refusal that you see laid bare before you. And this, a most precious gift, the letter you signed, that reminds us of the need to stay with those relationships within the scene, the need to abandon with full heart and once and for all, the bankrupt search for sexed, gendered, sexual, raced origins. It opens up the possibility of change, but it also requires staying in the grief, refusing to look away, reworking the memories to stay in that glorious as if. For Amal, preoccupation is a bodily as well as textual attention to detail. For you, Catherine, the intimacy of touch is expressed as affirmation in all its different meanings. It's a gesture a round of applause, a review, a touch, a public or private declaration, a gift from one to the other. Dear Amal, I see you walking towards me again that last time. Yes, you still got that absurdly heavy backpack on and you walk slowly across the landscaped heavy inverted commas, concrete at Dalston Junction. I run towards you so I can clasp you, be greeted, be folded up by my Amal. The light catches your bright white hair and echoes off your shy direct smile that spreads across your whole face. Beams of light cascade, concentrate, bounce off the dirty scaffolding and break into rainbows as they hit the polluted Dalston air. You smile that impossible smile and it refracts and refracts and concentrates and bounces off all the bodies crammed, in, crammed into that filthy street. It makes a parting of the ways that forces you into the limelight. You laugh at that, the limelight not being your natural habitat and your anyway belly laughter and your deep bright smile generate a force that pushes and pushes at the limits of the space we are in. Your Amal light shimmers and cracks and shoots off from that dirty Dawson Street, off the pollution and the bodies and between us and into the murky sky. It opens a tear in that nondescript sky as we watch in wonder. It opens up not much more than a small tear in that damp, miserable sky. And because time has stopped and gravity has stopped and the world has for a moment stopped in its tracks because of your smile, and because I won't and can't, and it is unbearable, I jump up and grasp the sides of that tear and pull on its edges with all my might. And I know I can't stop you falling over or smiling or listening, Amal. I can't stop you wearing that ridiculous backpack or getting on the number 38 bus. Look, there you are, falling again, as well as smiling and listening. My feet are a mile above the ground and I can see you falling over on the pavement outside the supermarket and smiling in Dalston and listening to Kareem and getting back up and not knowing how to talk to your father and laughing at dolphins and sharks and, of course, at me. And, at my, my, and my vertigo disappears. 
I can't stop you from falling. It keeps on happening. Look, there you are falling again and smiling and listening. <clears throat> but I can promise to hold on with all my might to that tear in the world that only the refraction of your smile could have rent. I can promise to try and hold open those edges, keep going back to the places we met, keep jumping up a mile above the filth where you smiled and listened and fell. Keep going back to where it smells like jasmine and warm wood. Thank you. <laughs>